start just dancing to the music there. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wave 2 of Microsoft Learn Together series for Microsoft Fabric. My name is Shabna Watson. I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP and owner of ABI Cube, a consulting company. Today, I also have Treb Gada here with me. Treb? I am coming to you live from Bellevue, Washington, USA, right down the street from Bell from uh, Microsoft here. I'm also an MVP and they're calling me a super user. So I guess that means I use Power BI a lot. We're looking forward to talking to you more about Fabric today. So with that, let's get some uh, ads out of the way, I guess. Awesome, let's, let's do a high five in. first. Oh, yeah, let's do the high first five. I don't know which side, well, I I'm, I'm going to do both sides <laughs> just to be, okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Yes, yeah. so uh, we also have two fantastic Microsoft Data Platform MVPs, Reed Havens and Chris Hyde are in the chat helping us moderate. So uh, please feel free to say hi to them. Uh, if there are any questions that they cannot answer, they're gonna pass them uh, to us, although I doubt they, they, there will be any of those questions that they cannot answer. If there are some questions that they feel uh, that they're important for everybody else also know, they may also pass those questions to us. Uh, so today we're going to go through two of the Microsoft Learn modules. Uh, the links for the modules are here on this page if you want to follow along or you can scan that QR code if you want to follow the modules now or later on your own. Um, so again, if you're watching this on April 15th, um, it's 7 p.m. Eastern US time. It's 9 a.m. Uh, New Zealand, Australian time. This is a live session, so feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Um, so if you're just starting with Microsoft Fabric, one of the greatest resources that's available right now is a Microsoft Career Hub. I use this hub a lot because I use the links on it to jump into a bunch of other Microsoft uh, places, including the Microsoft Learn modules. Um, so one of the things that's in, on this website is several people have done uh, interviews and uh, you can go through their experiences of how they Came, out, came into the community, how the community helped them become successful from in their career. Uh, so as you can see, I'm one of those individuals. I'm honored to be on this side, but I also encourage you to go and watch the stories of the other fellow community members. Some have very inspiring stories and backgrounds, and not everybody has come into this career from a uh, professional IT training background. We have several people who have successfully transitioned into a data uh, career using the community as a support uh, tool available to them. So definitely check out the site. Uh, one of the things that's available on this site is how Microsoft sees the data professional roles uh, across Microsoft Fabric. So uh, this is how Microsoft sees different roles that are going to be able to collaborate together um, in Microsoft Fabric, and it shows you what parts of Microsoft Fabric each role is going to use. This is not necessarily what you're gonna see in real world in every single company. So this is just a guideline and a sample. In some of the companies, you're gonna have one person who's gonna wear all these hats and in some other companies, you're gonna have very specific roles. So again, use this as a tool for learning. Uh, some of the other things that you can find on the site are the cloud skills challenges. These are the challenges that you can take and they will give you a very guided tour through Microsoft Learn modules so that you can stay focused. And from time to time, we also offer discount codes for you to take the certification exam of DP600 if you want to get certified for Microsoft Fabric Analytics Engineer. Uh, also, uh, one of the things on the site is a Learn series together that you're watching right now. So you can find links to the previous recordings and the upcoming sessions here. And this is the Cloud Skills Challenge that I mentioned. Again, the discount on this chain on this page changes from time to time, but regardless, um, you will most of the times I've seen discounts from 30% to sometimes even 100%. So uh, most likely you will not have to pay full price or hopefully you will not have to pay full price for the certification. The challenges are timed though, so make sure you take advantage of them while they're going on. And um, Right now, there's also another learning opportunity available for you. It's the exam cram session that you see the timing for it is available on the slide. So make sure to take advantage of that uh, live session as well. 
All right, so today is the wave two of the Microsoft Learn Together series. This is the first session of the second wave. And as you can see, there is gonna be several other sessions coming up. So make sure you go through all of these to get a full training for Microsoft Fabric and get started. Now with that, we're gonna to go to Treb and Treb is gonna show us what Microsoft Fabric is all about. Thank you. And hopefully you're going to find this so compelling that you're going to go to the link right now and you're going to want to follow along because they're going to show you some really great stuff. So I'm going to start off with, you know, are you really loving having to duplicate your data to move it between data stacks? I mean, is this something you really enjoy or would it be better to have a single source of the truth? Or do you feel like you're doing more integration work than perhaps the data work that you really should be doing every day? If that's the case, then wouldn't it be great if we had one platform that had holistic capabilities that make it easier to manage and easier to secure? Well, guess what? We do, and that is what Microsoft Fabric is all about. So today in this session, we're going to cover the full, uh, we're gonna cover end-to-end -end analytics with Microsoft Fabric, give you the high-level tour of this. We'll talk about what end-to-end -end means actually. We're going to talk about the core features and capabilities of lake houses and fabric. We're going to show you how to create a lake house. We're going to ingest some data because what good is a lake house if we can't get data in it? So we're going to take you through how to do that. And then if you just love the feel of, you know, artisan source handcrafted SQL code, we're going to show you how to query those tables with SQL as well. So we're going to have some fun today. All right. So we'll, let's move on a little bit here. So what exactly is fabric? I mean, Microsoft talks about this end-to-end -end analytics uh, platform, but what exactly does that mean? Well, it depends because if you're coming to this from the business side where your end-to-end -end is you're querying a bunch of SharePoint lists, you're bringing it through Power BI, maybe the desktop or Power BI service, you're building your dashboards and reports off of that, that's your end-to-end. -end. But say you're working for a large healthcare company, you're pulling in millions of rows of records every day, Perhaps now you're using pipelines to bring this in. You've got you know, your uh, bronze, silver, gold environments set up and you're bringing this all the way to a full blown data warehouse. That's your end end. And the reason that I mention all this is because there's no cookie cutter solution here. You can make fabric whatever you need, however you need it for your environment. We have that flexibility built in here. But realistically, some of the problems that they were trying to solve was A, we're spending a lot of time just moving data around and then trying to integrate these capabilities into with each other. And this helps eliminate that work. Uh, we had one CIO at, uh, at Ignite when it was first uh, announced talk about they wanted to be the chief information officer, not the chief integration officer. So, you know, this helps you get away from that. Also, when we start duplicating data, it makes it very hard to secure. It makes it hard to know what is actually the right version. So again, we eliminate that with, with here. And realistically, these fragment solutions that we've been dealing with for years are just hard to manage and they're, they add up. I mean, the cost adds up very quickly. So with Fabric, I think you're in a much better place to be uh, than you were before. So let's dive into this a little bit more and let's talk about the pieces. So if you've been to a Microsoft event recently concerning Fabric, you've probably seen this. And if this is new to you, we're gonna go through it uh, from stem to stern here. So let's let's look at these pieces. From the left to right, we've got data integration. So if you need to bring data in, uh, we're going to look at data fabric or data factory. Um, we're going to we have data engineering. So if we need to modify your data, we have Synapse. So if you're familiar with Synapse, we didn't leave you behind. We just gave you more stuff to play with. See, so and that's one message I want to leave you with is that with all of this, we're simply expanding the toolbox for you. So if you're coming from a Power BI background or you're coming from a data warehousing background, and whatnot, you've got more to play with. So you're starting to see the branding merge under Fabric. So data engineering, data warehousing, data science, all of this will then talk to the same substrate, which is one lake. Same thing with real-time analytics. If Kusto is your jam, we've got that too. Power BI is my area of expertise. So I love the fact that I can do reporting all over all of this, that our data teams are all working together in one environment, not four of them. And then the latest kit on the block, data activator. So not only can you pull in your data, transform it and analyze it, but now you can act upon it. So 
you haven't heard of data activator where say I'm tracking the uh, temperature of my refrigerator trucks in my fleet. And I know if I get above a certain temperature, the ice cream is going to melt and truly melted ice cream is such a tragedy. So we don't want that to happen. Data activator can keep your ice cream frozen, keep you on top of it, let you know maintenance needs to happen right there immediately. So all of this is then built on one lake. One lake is a fantastic revolution, if you will, with what they've done here. But one lake gives us the ability to store all this information in one place. All right, so let's take a, let's take another look at this from a slightly different perspective. Because when you're looking at this list of tools, it's kind of hard to see where do I belong in all this? So we said, you know what, let's group this around the key activity that you're going to do. So analysis and action. This, well, let's start at the bottom left here because move and transform. So if you're new to the data world, this is how we connect to our data sources, bring the data into our solution, transform it. Usually we're either fixing format issues or we're adding business rules, very important stuff to do. So we, here we have all the tools that we, we've had before. So we had Data Factory, we had uh, Synapse as well for uh, data warehousing and data engineering. If you're familiar with using the Azure versions of this, those are slightly different. So depending on your need, you might want to take a look between the two because right now there's not full parity between them. And it might be you need something that you have to uh, stay with Azure with, but we hope to bring you into Fabric. Fabric is still evolving. So hopefully those gaps will disappear over the next the gap, and the gaps are getting smaller and smaller. smaller. Yeah. So we are getting to feature parity almost 100% with Data Factory, Azure yeah. Data Factory. And something to point out is that these are software as a service version. They're not the same products. They're the SaaS version. Yeah. And all of this, so even though you have access to all these tools, you may be focusing on a given area. So lately, I'm doing a lot with Power BI, I'm doing a lot with Data Activator. And because the, we're in the, we're giving the business information of activities as they're happening. And one of the coolest things I've seen was actual personal monitoring of health, where they're streaming the data off the sensors on that a person has on and running it through Data Activator to be able to say, hey, you know, their heart rate's up a little bit, maybe we should do something about that. So there's some really cool things to take a look at. And then if data science is your jam, if you're loving Python, if you dream in Python, we've got that too. So again, it's not, it's not something you wanna be overwhelmed by. You can pick where you wanna start. If you're coming from this from a known background, like you, you've been doing data warehousing for 20 years, again, we're giving you more tools to play with. And because this is all using the same data source, it makes it easier to broaden your skills, to learn other parts of this, and also offer more capabilities for your end users. So it's a great thing. When you first get into it, because we wanna see the product. So this is your first look. This is the homepage of Fabric. And if you go in, you'll see these nice big cards that talk about the various solutions that are here. Now, you can also get to this from any number of different places uh, within the tool, and we'll see that a bit later. But uh, again, if I go to app.fabric.microsoft.com, this is what I see. If I go into Power BI, maybe that's where I live most of the time, there's a way to get to it from there. In fact, there's a way to get to this from every one of the experiences in Fabric. All right, and hopefully that makes sense for everybody. Now I keep talking about one link. So what is one link? Well, before, again, when you're going through your various processes, you usually wind up with these pillars of data. A lot of times it's being replicated, it might be slightly different, but there's timing issues. Uh, there's all sorts of problems with this. So they said, you know what, we need one place to store everything. Well, not all data is structured. So one of the things that One Lake, which is built on Azure Data Lake Storage, gives us is the ability to store both structured and unstructured data in one place. Now, we're looking at this from a Fabric perspective. One of the other things I've been working with is a little thing called Azure AI Search, which if you use Copilot or anything like that, it can also talk to OneLake. And so if I have unstructured PDFs and whatnot, I can actually sort in OneLake and as a way to get to stuff. Um, now, the various formats that are supported by OneLake, and there are several, but the main ones we want to focus on are really CSV, which you know goes back way, way, far in time, we all know and love it. And then something called Parquet or Delta Parquet, if you will. So 
the default uh, format that Fabric uses is really Delta Parquet, which is an a enhanced version of the Parquet format. And the Delta part of it is that it keeps a copy, a history, if you will, of all of the changes that have happened to that data, which makes it very easy and quick to get to that information when we need to. The, um, and also, because we're now keeping one copy of the information, we can do both batch and streaming operations on one set without an issue. So again, this is exciting stuff. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a look at what a Fabric workspace looks like, which again, if you're coming to this from the Power BI world, looks very familiar, just different icons, slightly different organization. And a lot of the changes that we've seen recently in Power BI are actually due to Fabric coming out. So if, uh, and, and we'll talk more about that. Um, the other thing about Delta is that this gives us not only efficient handling of big data, but it supports ACID. So we'll talk more about ACID in a bit, but uh, there's a pop quiz on this. So uh, at atomic, I never could say this, atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability are really what ACID stands for. And we really love this in the data world. So one leg gives that to us all in one. We also have integrated data management. So again, very easy to work with this, keep your information in one place. And also from a security standpoint, it's just this, you're, you're hearing more about something called one security, there's more features coming, but this is where it's going to happen. So we only have one place to manage this instead of like five, which honestly, I, I just can't stand. The um, the other aspect I'll, I'll pull out here is we've heard a reference called OneDrive for your data, which I think is a very apt way of thinking about uh, OneLake. Because if you've used OneDrive, you put your file out there and you never worry about it because Microsoft does so much for you in the background. They might let you know occasionally that you're out of storage, like me, because I'm a digital pack rat, but it's easy. It's just that easy. And so OneLake is really going for that OneDrive for your data, if you will, very similar to the way Office makes it. And again, um, it just makes it easier uh, to take data from not only in your region, and in your cloud, but I can also add information using shortcuts from AWS, from Google. You can basically create a, a, a virtual one lake, if you will, uh, by pulling in data from all these places. All right, uh, do we have any questions that uh, we need to, I don't see anything on, at the moment, so I think, I think we're good. All right, I'll just, like I need to stop and take a breath here, so you know it's always good if I just pause and see if we have any questions. Right. No, we have two great moderators in the chat, so I doubt it really that we'll get that many questions to us. It's all good. It's all good. We just want to make sure yeah. that uh, everybody's taken care of here. Okay, let's talk about data teams and fabric. Again, it's a different way of looking at this, but we said, you know, these are the roles that Microsoft has defined for the product. A role in the product like this will shape what documentation is done, how the training is conducted, and also from an implementation standpoint, where they give the type of guidance. Now, realistically, I mean, I've worked in, you know, 200,000 employee companies where we do actually have these different roles. In fact, I think every company has these roles, but we don't necessarily have people who are strictly in a role, if you will, because again, most people wear multiple hats. I have several myself. I'm just wearing a more stylish one today. But, you know, on a given day, I could be doing data engineering work. I could be doing Azure ML work. I could be trying to figure out why my Power BI model or semantic model is not refreshing. And then, oh, by the way, we're pulling data out of Microsoft 365. So again, you may be in multiple places here. So don't let the role get in the way of you learning the product. It's just a way of framing the functionality in a way that makes more sense, hopefully, to what you do every day. The ones that are in yellow are there because we do have the ability to integrate with other tools. So it makes it easier then to see how this is not just an island, if you will, but Fabric actually can connect to many, many, many different things within the Microsoft ecosystem. I'm very excited about this from a perspective of Document AI, which is another thing that we've been using where if I have an email that comes in, we can drop off the PDF, we can extract all the data out of that document, we can drive workflow, and then we could push this into Fabric and drive our analytics. And with Data Activator, we can then drive further activity going on. And 
all of this is seamless. It works beautifully. And in those cases, you may be working across three or different, four different roles. Then at the bottom here, we can't forget our data stewards. So these are not only our data engineers, which we have a separate section for, but these are the folks for security, for compliance, that sort of thing. So we have integration with Purview, and there's just uh, there's also some uh, further capabilities that are coming to help you with other parts of Microsoft that you would then push into Fabric so you, that you can do broader reporting, not just on your data estate, but on your content estate as well in Office 365. So there's a lot of good stuff coming there. All right, so let's get in. So hopefully this is all sounding good. It's like you're intrigued, perhaps you haven't seen it yet. And you're like, I want to try this. So how exactly do I do that? Well, chances are you need to enable it. And in order to enable it, you're going to have to be an admin. So hopefully the Power BI admin, you know, which I've had for a long time, is now called a Fabric admin. So you've been upgraded, think of it that way. But you have to either be a Fabric admin, a Power Platform admin, or a Microsoft 365 admin. Or if you have complete control over the whole tenant, you have global admin rights. But any of those four will give you the ability to get to where you need to be to turn this on. And then once the feature is turned on, you create a workspace just like we do in Power BI. And you have to assign that workspace to either a Fabric capacity, if you've actually bought it, you've got everything set up for licensing and whatnot. Or if you're just dabbling in, in the pond here, just trying it out, we have the trial that's set up for you automatically. So again, those are the real two steps that you have to make here. And if you go into the admin center, so this is going into the Fabric Admin Center, you will see under tenant settings now this new switch that says users can create Fabric items. One thing to note is the under part of this, because one of the things that always scares admins is when I have to turn on something and, oh my goodness, everybody starts creating stuff willy-nilly and things get out of control. Let's not do that. So at the bottom here, you could set up a security group. You can specify which security groups have the ability to do this and then start growing it in a controlled fashion from there. But absolutely try it out. Get your feet wet. I think there's a lot of goodness to be have to be had here, but we want to make sure that we're not tripping on our own shoelaces by letting the Wild West happen. So I strongly recommend setting up some security groups and then only giving them the ability to try this out initially until you can figure out what's going on. Also, you can even start with one or two users yeah. to, to get started, even if you want to start smaller. Yeah, and starting small is good. You know, crawl, walk, run. We say that and. This is definitely a place where you want to do that. All right, hopefully this has made a lot of sense. I've conveyed a lot of knowledge. You're feeling good about it. Did I tell you that there's a test? So go to, to the polls URL here. We're going to throw three questions at you. All right, and hopefully you're absolutely ready. Okay, so aka.ms slash polls. We're going to go there and I'm going to ask the question. I'm going to read the answers give you a few minutes to answer, and then I'm gonna read back who got it right, who didn't. No shaming, it's okay to get it wrong, but we want you to participate. Okay, so question one, which of the following is a key benefit of using Microsoft Fabric in data projects? A, it allows data professionals to work on data projects independently without the need for collaboration. Hmm. B, it requires duplication of data across different systems and teams to ensure data availability. Or C, it provides a single integrated environment for data professionals and the business to collaborate on their data projects. So, come on, let's see some votes here. Oh, we're getting some votes, this is good. A lot coming of votes in. coming in. Yeah, it's looking good, looking good. All right, it looks like here. everybody's getting it right. This is good. So we're going to do five, four, three, two, one. Ding, 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 ding. So right answer is C. Yes, single integrated environment for everybody to collaborate on their projects. Second question, what is the default storage format for Fabrics OneLink? Is it A, Delta Parquet, B, JSON, or C, CSV? the one we know and love. 
Let's see what those answers are. Okay, so they're rolling in. Oh, we got a little bit more of a spread here. Let's see what's going to happen. Yeah. Interesting. So we're talking about the default one, not what yeah, that would can support the default. Oh, we're seeing some changes here. Okay. People are changing their mind. All right. So five, four, three, two, one. Delta Parquet. Remember, we switched over to Parquet, and the, and the Delta part keeps the history of the changes to that information, making it easier and faster to access it as we need to. So y'all doing good. Uh, I'm loving the interaction here. So we got one more question for you before we get to our demo. And which of the following fabric workloads is used to move and transform data? A, data science, B, data warehousing, or C, data factory? Let's see if we can stump them with this one. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know. We got a lot more spread on this one. This is interesting. All right. We're going to do five, four, three, last chance, two, get that voted, one, and dun, 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 data factory. So hopefully you're one of the ones who got the right answer on every one of these. So the right answers were C, A, and C. So hopefully you're good there. All right. So with that, uh, we're going to, well, we're going to get to the demo in a minute, but uh, I want to get started with the, uh, just talk more about the lake house and what is a lake house. And frankly, first time I heard this stuff, I was pretty confused myself because I come from more of the traditional data warehousing background. So one, the data lake was something that uh, people had before. Usually people in the Spark world were working with this and there was a lot of ability to store you know, files and unstructured data in here and then create a structured uh, construct on top of it. Whereas with the data warehouse, we're doing a lot of you know, moving, cleaning and whatnot to get it into this very structured format. And there's a lot of advantages to both. Uh, so they said, well, what happens if we take this and we combine them? Because on the lake side, we have the ability for, it's very scalable, it's distributed, and frankly, it was pretty cheap at the time. And one of the big things about it is you can define your schema when you're reading your data. So it's not frozen in this format. If you've ever worked with anything like really old data, like from an AS400 or a mainframe or something, you always get these weird situations where it's like digits one through four mean something and five through eight mean something. And, this way you can dynamically, you know, define this. And a lot of, and really it was designed for big data. On the data warehouse, we get relational schema modeling. We get our SQL base because everybody loves SQL, right? And it's been around for a long time. So it's very, very durable. So by combining these, uh, we basically can present something that looks like a database, but it's built on top of a data lake using those Delta format tables. And this, one of the big things that Microsoft did as part of the Fabric development is they took all of the engines that they have among all their data products and they changed them to read this Delta Parquet format. So your Spark and SQL engines are reading the same source of data, no more having to move it between them. And because we're taking advantage of the Lakehouse data, the Schema on Read format really helps you with how you want to get that data out very quickly. Again, we have asset uh, support here, which is awesome. And you, the lake houses can be a single location for everyone. With shortcuts uh, and with some of the other capabilities, you can actually bring in data from other lake houses into one and use them as if they were all there. And it could be from another cloud as well. So this is a really amazing piece of technology. Now, um, depending on where you're coming from. so. If you're coming from the Power BI world, you may or may not be using data marts. I love them. I think they're awesome for what they are, but you may be using semantic models. If you're coming from the data warehouse side, you have all these capabilities here. So when we throw a lake house in here, how do I determine which alternative should I be using? So what we did is we put together this table. Uh, this is from the, doc the uh, learn documents and highlighted some key things that you should be aware of. Excuse me. So from a Power BI data mark perspective, 
you are limited on storage. So depending on your licensing, you can go up to 100 gigabits, which for a lot of business related reporting is probably plenty, but you're not going to be doing, you know, serious you know, Fortune 50 heavy duty reporting out of a data mark. It's really not where it shines. There are other alternatives for that. But you do have RLS, you have data flows, you have T-SQL. You know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of goodness there. On the data warehouse side, one of the things that it has that we really desire out of data warehouses is this multi-table transactions because say you're dealing with healthcare and insurance uh, claims and whatnot, this is a huge thing you absolutely want to get it right every time. And so if something goes wrong, you want that transaction to roll back because we incomplete or worse, uh, incorrect data is just a terrible problem. So data warehouses help you solve these problems. The lake, again, I can have unstructured, semi-structured, structured data all in one place. I can use SQL, Spark, or Power Query, whichever one I'm comfortable with. and I can have a uh, row level and table security. Spark is still, it's one of those gaps that's still being closed, but we're getting, it. now the one thing too, if it's fine, the uh, access via shortcuts, it's like data warehouse says yes, via the lake house. So basically if you want to be able to access data, maybe you've got it sitting in AWS, maybe you've got it sitting somewhere else. You wanna bring that data in easily, then the lake house is where you would select. Again, when you're looking at these various alternatives, you still want to take do your due diligence to make sure the features you need for what you are doing line up. And it's not that you can't use the data warehousing or data marts. It's just you have choices now. So do do what you need to do to ensure you, that you're taking your due diligence that you've got the right features for what you need. All right. Um, so from working with data lake houses. So we're going to show you then, um, or hang on, this is actually, I'm supposed to switch. I'm sorry. I, I'm so excited. I jumped ahead. <laughs> You're doing such a great job. I was actually listening to you and learning. So uh, it's good. It's good. All, right. All, all right. All right. All right. I'm handing it over to you. I'm going to. Okay. So hopefully we'll get my screen up in a second. There we go. All right. So. Every time you create a lake house in Microsoft Fabric, it comes with two other items. But uh, first, let me stop here and just mention that everything in Microsoft Fabric works within the context of a workspace. So within a workspace today, if you're coming from Power BI, you may have Power BI reports and semantic models. When you get Microsoft Fabric or when you get you know, started from Microsoft Fabric, if, even if you didn't have Power BI before, uh, you work within the context of a workspace. Now, in a workspace, you will create a lake house and the lake house will come with two other items with it immediately. One is a default semantic Power BI model that's going to be in direct lake storage mode. So I'll talk about this a uh, little bit more when we do the demo, but the key point here is that the Power BI engine in Microsoft Fabric has a new storage mode. It's been updated so that it can now also read those Delta Parquet files. So it's gonna work super fast and give you the performance of import with the near real time benefits of direct query. So if you're coming from Power BI, you're probably familiar with those storage modes. Direct Lake is a new storage mode that's gonna give you the best of both without any refreshes, without any movement of data. Again, this is possible because Power BI is now one of the engines within the Microsoft family of products and they all read Delta Parquet files. So that's the first item that you get. The second item that you get with a lake house, anytime you create a lake house, is a SQL endpoint. So the SQL endpoint is what you connect to from tools like SQL Server Management Studio, or even from within Fabric to write your SQL queries um, and analyze your data. Okay, so here's what it looks like as Treb showed you a screenshot before so on this screen what you see is that we have a lake house called lake house training and then underneath it we have a semantic model a default semantic model and a sql analytics endpoint so you get a default semantic power bi model which is great to get started with but if you want to create a custom one also you can also create a custom one and do additional uh, things in there so 
All right, you create an empty lake house. How do you get data into a lake house? There are several options available. You can upload the data from the lake house explorer uh, from your local computer or network drive. You can upload a file there. That's the easiest way to get a small um, file up there. Um, and, and then beyond that, you get several options. So Fabric is all about the options. And which one you choose depends on several factors. It's not always about what gives you the best performance or uh, most capabilities. Sometimes it depends on your current skill set, the skill sets that you want to learn, and the group of people you work with. None of these projects are done uh, in isolation by one person. Most of these projects involve several people. So you have to always take into consideration the skill sets of your team and the people who are going to support that. So for example, if you're coming from a code first experience, so you have pro developers and they love writing code, then the notebooks, the PySpark or Spark SQL notebooks are the right tool for you. If you are coming from a background of low code, no code, where you're more comfortable with the GUI, drag and drop, and working maybe even with Power Query, then Dataflows Gen 2 are the right tool for you. And then we have the data factory pipelines. So the pipelines are your data orchestration tools. Think of pipelines as what you schedule to run. So it lets you have a canvas and you can put several activities on it. You can have control flow. You can send an email out, post something in Teams if an activity fails. And one of the activities in there is the copy activity. So you can bring data in with a copy activity from a pipeline. You can pick it up from there with the data flows gen two and do transformations on it. Now the pipelines themselves don't have data transformation um, capabilities beyond some basic features like renaming column or changing a data type. If you wanna do data transformations, data flows gen two is your low code, no code tool. The other code first tool is the notebooks. All right, so again, lots of options for you to choose from. So we're going to go to the next slide and talk about the shortcuts. So shortcuts are an ability for you to access data that's not local to your lake house, but you can still query the data as if it were right there in your lake house. So you can create a shortcut to other items within Microsoft Fabric or you can create a shortcut to something that's sitting in Amazon S3 and several other sources that are coming up and there's gonna be more of them even as time goes by. So you can use the shortcuts to, to query cross lake houses, whether they're in the same workspace or cross workspaces or to external data. So shortcut doesn't really move the data. One of the use cases for shortcuts is that you can explore data that's sitting in a remote storage without actually moving it. And then you can decide whether you wanna move it or not. So that's just one use case for shortcuts. Plus we're getting okay. mirroring. Yes, and so mirroring actually moves the data, right? Mirroring moves the data. Shortcuts do not move the data. Um, so when it comes to choosing which tool to use, you have here what we're showing on this slide is that on the left hand side, again, you have the low code, no code of pipelines and data flows gen two. And then on the right hand side, you have the spark, which is the spark notebooks. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that this data flows gen two is not the same thing as data flows gen one. Uh, one difference here is that with data flows gen one or the current previous data flows in Power BI. If you loaded that with data, that's where it stayed. You couldn't take that and put it anywhere else. You could point a Power BI model to it and refresh from it, but you could not write that data anywhere else. With data flows gen two, you have write capabilities. You can take that transformed data and you can write it to within Microsoft Fabric, to a lake house or a warehouse, or you can write it to even an Azure SQL DB. Uh, so that's one difference. And then when you look between the pipelines on data flows gen two as ingestion tool for, for the ingestion part, uh, you have different number of connectors. So if you're looking for specific connectors, you may want to go to data flows gen two. If you love power query, you want to go to data flows gen two. Um, and so you have many options again to choose from. All right, so uh, this is the part where we're gonna go through the exercise that's in the learn module. So I'm gonna switch right now to the 
fix their size. Let me switch out of here and bring up Microsoft Fabric here. Okay, so this is, this is the landing page for Microsoft Fabric. And if I go to the bottom left here, you see that I have this icon here. This is because this tenant is enabled to have Microsoft Fabric. So if I go here, you see that there's all of these different experiences that Trev explained before. Now, if you go to any one of these experiences, it doesn't mean that you're locked into that one particular item only. So if I go to a Power BI, it doesn't mean I cannot create a lake house or warehouse or data factory. Um, all these do is that they give you a very focused view into the items that are available for you to create. So if I go into the data science, it will, it's going to change my icons on the top that I choose from. So I'm going to go to the data engineering one for now because that's what the lab uh, instructions said. So once we go in here, you see that I have icons to create a lake house or a notebook. Um, and so... I'm going to create one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to create a workspace. So I'm going to click on new workspace and I'm going to call this W3. And down here, what I can do is that I can attach this to a capacity. Now, this is a trial. I'm going to attach the trial capacity. That's going to uh, give me an F64. If I had a, a premium capacity or an F SKU, I could have attached to that. So I'm going to click on apply. And this will attach my workspace to that capacity. And now I can create all of these items, any one of them that I want. So if I click on the data engineering icon again from here, you're going to notice that I have the shortcuts up here. Uh, one of the things that Trev pointed out to me while we were preparing for this demo was that make sure that when you go to this view, make sure that this workspace is the workspace that you intended to be on. So up on top of here, just make sure that it doesn't say my workspace. It's the one that you intended to be on. Yeah, that, nothing right. is ter more terrible than creating something and then you can't find it because you have no idea where it went. And uh, yep. so, <laughs> so I, I had done that by accident. We were talking about it going, yep. And then it, I t it turned out I created it in my, my workspace. So that was a, a whole different problem. So yes, please. Yes. Pay attention. Yes, and which 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 brings us to, by the way, do not share out of my workspace. My workspace is for your use only and maybe sharing with a couple of friends, but it's not for production use. So make sure in a real works, you're in a real workspace. Okay, so I'm gonna click on the lake house and create a lake house. And as you can see, I've been practicing uh, for this today. So let's see if it actually lets me type in here. Hmm. Okay. Here we go. All right. L being persistent. Here we go. L three, you know, this is live. All right. Okay. So I'm going to click on create and this will create a lake house. It's going to be an empty lake house. And what this is going to do is that it's going to create a lake house. It's going to have an area, one lake attached to it. It's just the storage area that comes with your workspace. It's your area one lake. So the one lake is the sum of all of the storage areas across all of the workspaces across Fabric. And while it's creating the lake house, it's also creating those two additional items that we mentioned for us. So it's creating the SQL analytics endpoint and the default uh, semantic model. So you can see on the top here, it actually tells us that a SQL analytics endpoint for querying and a default semantic Power BI model for reporting is being created. Okay, so I'm going to click on this and then I'm going to go back out to the workspace for a moment to just show you these additional items that were created. Okay, so I'm going to click back on the workspace and as you can see, we have a lake house and underneath it, we have the semantic model. This is the default semantic model. If you want, you can create custom ones as well, as well as the SQL analytics endpoint. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the lake house. And here, in the, we're in the lake house explorer. There's nothing in here so far. And what you see on the screen on the left-hand side is the explorer. So there's two parts to a lake house. There is a, um, there is a file section and there is a table section. On the left-hand side, I'm gonna click on new, 
going to click on new subfolder, create a subfolder called data. And then I'm going to use the upload feature from here um, to load some files in here. So I'm going to click on load files, click on my browser, and bring in the uh, sales files. So um, by the way, the, if you're following the instructions in the lab, um, it actually tells you to download this file and save it somewhere. I've already done that, so I'm not showing you that step. I had already downloaded the uh, sales here. So I'm going to click on open, and this is in the CSV format. Upload it. It just takes a few moments for this to upload. And now I have the file here under the files section. So what we want to do is we want to take this from the file section and land it into the table section because that's the manage section of the lake house. That's where we can write our SQL queries uh, game. So again, several, several ways to get the file from here to the table section. Um, here we're going to follow the simplest one, which is clicking in front of the file and saying load to tables. So we're going to say new table. We haven't created anything before, so it's going to be a new table. The separator is a comma, and this is going to load the table. So what this is doing right now is that it takes a CSV file and moves it to the table section. Because this is using a Microsoft Fabric engine to do this, it's going to automatically write this for us in the Delta Part K format. And as soon as this is done, I can show you the files that it's creating. Okay, looks like it's done. So let me refresh, and here it is. And if you notice, there is a little triangle here next to the sales, and that tells us that that's actually a um, Delta file. And from here, what I can do is I can go to the notebook. If I'm a Spark person, I can analyze it using uh, Spark notebook. But here, we want to show you how to do this using SQL. So I'm going to switch to the SQL analytics endpoint to do the uh, SQL part. So several ways to get to it. If you're in this particular view, one of the easiest ways to get to it is by clicking on the top right-hand corner here where you see it says Lake House. If you click on this drop-down, it will take you to the SQL analytics endpoint. So again, let me close that message. Here you can see that we have the table itself, but we also have views, functions, and stored procedures. So here we're getting the SQL experience. Uh, one thing to point out, though, is that the, the functions and stored procedures, these are read-only. This is because this is a lake house. The Spark engine is in control. So the T-SQL is read-only. All right. So we can query this data uh, several ways. One of them is to click on this a button here called New SQL Query. And I have a query here ready to copy and paste from the lab. So let me bring that over here. And then I can run this query. You mean you don't there have like a thousand people watching you type? <laughs> I, I was smart enough to actually have the query ready. Um, <laughs> OK, so here it is. Um, so once I have the query, I can save it. The query goes here on the bottom left under my queries. This is just for me. If I want to share this with someone else, for example, if Treb is also part of this workspace, all I have to do is to click here and say move to shared queries. And then other people in the workspace can also see the queries. Now, if you are not a SQL person, um, you have some options here. So you can go to new visual query if you prefer the low code, no code experience. And there is a very cool graphical user interface here. So you can grab the table and drag and drop it here. And hopefully, this will work. Um, there we go. OK, so we have the table here. and. It didn't like it. All right, I spoke too soon. Let me refresh. Um, it's live, folks. We, we promised you a live show. So we're going to yeah. occasionally have some demo glitches. But yes. 
Okay, let's see. New visual query. One more time. If not, we're going to swap out to a different workspace. See, keeping fingers crossed. Yay, there it is. It seems like it's happy. It's happy? Okay. I think so. so yeah. yeah, so you can click on this um, button here. You can choose a number of transformations. By the way, if you're coming from Power BI and Power Query, these should look very familiar to you. Um, you can either choose from here or from the ribbon on the top. I'm going to choose from the ribbon on the top. I'm going to say Manage Columns. First thing we're going to do is we're going to choose just two of the columns, and then we're going to add a group by. So we're going to count the number of line items per sales order. Okay, so now I'm going to choose a group by and change the column name to items. We're going to count the distinct values of sales order line number and then click on OK. And now you can see that we have a visual query. Now at this point, you can save the query. If you like, you can click on view SQL. You can see the SQL that it actually generated from you, uh, for you. Um, and then you can also click on this icon on top right, and this will take you to the full Power Query experience. So here you can see all the steps on the right-hand side. You can modify it from here. And again, if you're a pro code person who loves M language, you can right click on this and see the advanced editor and this will take you to the M language. So um, hopefully one takeaway from this for you is that regardless of which language you like to work with, there's options here for you to choose from. And that's very important because when we're working in a team, we have different team members and they each have a different uh, ability or skill sets. It's important to have everybody be able to collaborate in one environment. Okay, so, so far we've been looking at the SQL analytics endpoint, but we also talked about the Power BI model, right? So the Power BI model is created for you automatically, but where is the model for it? Because this is nothing you can create in Power BI desktop today. In future, it may change, but right now it's only from the web. So the model for the uh, Power BI um, semantic model, the, the actual modeling part of it is available here under the SQL analytics endpoint. So notice I'm under SQL analytics endpoint. In the bottom left corner, we're under the query. I'm going to go under model, and this is what the model looks like. Now, uh, first thing you may notice is that there are a lot of other tables here that we didn't even create. What these are, these are DMV queries. These are um, additional metadata information about the lake house. So the only table that we uploaded is the sales table. And uh, one thing that we need to do is to go to the default semantic model and either drag and drop it in here, or we can click on this and say, add to default uh, semantic model. Now, uh, this has changed a little bit previously. As soon as you added the table to the table section, it would be added to the, uh, semantic default semantic model right now you need to make that additional step if you don't like that there is a setting up on here that you can toggle so if you toggle this to on anytime you add a table it will automatically be added to your default semantic model all right so once you have the model although this is the simplest model because we don't have any relationships we don't have any other tables uh, once you have those other tables you can drag and drop to create your relationships, you can click here and you can create a measure. Um, so you you can you you have access to full DAX language in here. And um, let me actually create a measure so that it doesn't actually uh, break. There we go. And yes, I am typing in a live stream. We can call this measure one. So you're here brave. We go. Yes. <laughs> So we have a measure and you can see the measure showed up here. Now, um, all you got to do is to get to a Power BI report is to click on this button up here that says new report. And this will create a report that's connected to the model. Now, remember, we didn't refresh. There was absolutely no Power BI refresh involved here. This is because the default semantic model is in direct lake and is working directly with those uh, Delta Parquet files. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a chart here and then pick a couple of the items from here. So we're going to look at the items and the quantity. 
and now I have a report. And it's a very simple report, but if I want to save this, I can click on save. And this gives me an option of where to actually save the report. So I'm going to call this report three and save this. And now the report is also created for me. Now, if I go back to the workspace, you will see that the workspace, again, you have a lake house, we have the semantic model, then uh, the SQL endpoint, and then the report. And that brings us to the end of the labs for this model. So with that, Trev. It looks simple, doesn't it? Back to you. So hopefully you it can follow very simple. Along. I mean, yes. the first time I did this, I'm like, really? This is it? This is awesome. And if you start looking at the other announcements, and my goodness, there have been a ton of announcements that have come out at the Fabric Conference and subsequent to the conference, you start to see how you can start to build on this foundation and build some really amazing applications. Uh, we had some questions that uh, I thought were pretty interesting, and one was pretty funny, like, why are data marts so slow? <laughs> it's like, well, you got to think of it this way. And I, and I know there was an answer from uh, one of the folks in there, but from a video on demand perspective, data marts were an early experiment, if you will, leading up to what the work that was done in Fabric. So it, it has its place, but realistically, given the choice between the two, if I want a robust, faster system, I would go with Fabric on that. And uh, it, it they are useful, but again, you can put 100 gig in there. I don't know if I would actually use it with 100 gig because it is slow. And they're not really investing any more with it. It's not like it's going away tomorrow, but the, it will eventually merge back into Fabric. So I, I've seen mostly organizations that are Mac only using data marts because they don't have the ability to build semantic models in the desktop kind of thing. And they can that's control a, the refreshes. That's yeah, actually yeah. a great question. I think uh, one thing to also um, think about is that the Synapse, the lake, the lake house and the warehouse that are powered by the Synapse engine, these are not your regular SQL databases, even though they're giving us a feel of an on-prem SQL server or an Azure SQL DB. These are massively parallel processing engines that they come to you in the form of software as a service. So you don't see all the uh, complexities behind the scenes, but they're extremely powerful engines to work with. All right, and then we had, let's see, there was, um, what is the, it? the, uh, the C SQL warehouse. Yeah, sorry, I, I scrolled and lost it. it. What's the recommendation on building a data warehouse and data mark in a lake versus a SQL warehouse? And I know you can build your SQL warehouse in Fabric, um, but you really need to look, again, this is what we were talking about earlier, look at the specific features of each and make your determination which fit, fits your need better if you will. And if you have anything else to add to that, or is that? Yeah, so I think the, the two experience, the lake house and the warehouse, uh, have come closer to each other. Um, you can do almost everything you can do with one with the other. They're very close to each other. Um, if you're, I would go back to the experience of the people that you're working with yourself and where you want to be. If you're mainly a SQL person, if your team is a SQL team, then the warehouse makes more sense. If your team is more of a data science, PySpark, Spark SQL team, then the lake house makes more, more sense. And also remember that you're not locked into one of these. One of the great things about Microsoft Fabric is that because the storage is separate from the compute, that means that you can use any one of these tools to write your data. Your data is always in Delta format. So you can start with a lake house, you can pick it up with the warehouse and vice versa. You're not locked in like today, you might be with the uh, on-prem SQL server. Once you store your data in that, that's the only tool that can understand that data and read it. You must use SQL server. But with Microsoft Fabric, Microsoft has chosen to open that up. So it's no longer a proprietary file storage format, if you want, you can use any tool to analyze uh, the data with. So with that comes the flexibility that if you go with an experience now, and then later a couple of months down the road, you think, oh, I should have gone with the other one. You can do that easily. You're not stuck. 
we have a late breaking question and I'm not sure we have enough time to go through it, but would you please explain licensing, especially capacity versus Power BI premium? Um, this is probably the number one question and has been like in the Power BI world since the beginning of time. I don't know, do we wanna address that or is that something maybe better for a later comment in the on the, the video? Because unless you have a shortcut way of stating it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's try. We can give it a try. So yeah. um, nothing about Power BI licensing changes. If you yeah. need a pro license today to do something, you will need a pro license to do that something also known as publishing. So everything about Power BI licensing stays the same. For non-Power BI items, you don't need to have a license as long as you're covered by a capacity. And capacities come in P SKUs, which are what we currently have, Power BI capacities, as well as F SKUs. There's a mapping between them. P1 is equivalent of F64. If you go below F64, so if you're starting with a fabric capacity and you go below F64, that's when you need Power BI licenses for both your publishers and consumers because you no longer get those Power BI premium workspaces. So that's the only thing. But for the rest of the fabric items, you're free to use any capacity that's below F64 as well. So hopefully that's a high level quick uh, <laughs> response to that. And if you are not following the Power BI blog, you really should be because all of the announcements around any changes will be made there first. So on March yeah. 14th, Kim Manis, who is the VP over all of this, they had a, a blog post on an important update regarding Power BI premium licensing. So again, I would they've been doing a lot of announcements recently. There's a lot of changes that are in the process. Stay tuned to the blog. It's probably the most easy way to to get the latest on a lot of the stuff because uh, it has been a challenge to keep up with it, even for us. So, and with that, uh, I think we're going to do a quick knowledge check to see if you were paying attention during the demo. So again, go to aka.ms/polls, and we're going to ask you a number of questions here, and let's see how you're doing. Let's see if you're ready to do the exercises and whatnot. And now if I can get PowerPoint to, to actually work. There we go. So what is a Microsoft Fabric Lake House? So we've been talking about it now for the last, I don't know, 45 minutes. Is it A, a relational database based on Microsoft SQL Server database engine? B, a hierarchy of folders and files in ADLS Gen 2 or Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, whichever you prefer? Or C, an analytic store that combines the file storage flexibility of a lake house with the SQL based query capabilities of a data warehouse. So let's see how you're answering. And we've got them rolling in here. This is awesome. Got a few rebels. It, it, it may give you the best of both worlds. That's yes. the hint. Hint, best of both. Everything is integrated. So right. you have the files in the lake, you can analyze them directly, or you can use SQL, you can use the relational database experience. There's right. lots of votes coming in. So with that, you're going to do five, four, three, last chance, two, final call, one. Ta-da, C. We seem to like C a lot for answers. I don't know why, but it seems to be, keep that coming is up true. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to change it up next time. All right, so let's go to question five here. You want to include data in an external Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 location into your lake house without the requirement to copy the data. What should you do? A, create a data pipeline that uses copy data activity to load the external data into a file. Hmm. B, create a shortcut. C, create a data flow, Gen2, that extracts the data and loads it into a table. Hmm, okay. Well, again, I don't want to move the data. I don't want to copy it. So which one sort of leads you to that? You know, get an interesting um, 
mix here, more of a spread. So maybe we haven't been as clear with this one. So I don't know. Again, we want to make sure we are not copying the data. We are not moving the data. So hopefully that will lead you to the right answer here. I'm um, seeing some people change their votes. So we'll, we'll, we'll allow it. No Again, moving, no moving your, of data. Your record. It's all in your permit record, that's what I'd say. Okay, so with that, <laughs> five, four, three, last call, two, one. Yes, create a shortcut. Shortcuts are amazing. And it, even there, you could create a virtual lake house that's just shortcuts going to other stuff. In fact, this was something that got talked about at the Ask the Experts at the uh, Fabric Conference that happened in Las Vegas recently. And the question came up and said, hey, can, can we do this where we actually don't have any real data in it, but we're pulling data from everywhere else? And uh, Kim basically said, yes, absolutely. It's totally supported. So there's a lot of opportunities to do some very creative architecting here if, you're, if you would like. All right, let's go to our next question. Because again, we didn't tell you there, was, there were questions. All right, you want to use Apache Spark to interactively explore data in a file in the lake house, what should you do? A, create a notebook. Sounds reasonable. B, switch to the SQL endpoint mode. Okay. C, create a data flow gen two. I think this one's a harder one uh, for a lot of people. We'll see. I like the way the answers are coming in. It's like, nope, we, we got this one. We, we're on top of it. Uh, I love it. Okay, so we're going to keep it going. Hopefully, this one is clear. Uh, you got to see it in the demo. You got to see some stuff you could do with this. That was weird. Sorry, the the votes just like cleared and then reloaded. So that was bizarre. All right, we're still looking for a few more votes here because I, I looked at the last one. We had a bunch of people voting, and this one not so much. Could just guess if you don't know the answer. Just guess at one. All right. And it's not C. It's, it's not, not C. C. <laughs> it's not C. <laughs> oh, come on. All right. Well, five, four, three, two, one. Yes, create a notebook. So most of you got that one right, though I have to say it was probably almost the lowest percentage of right of all the questions. So uh, it was mm -hmm. close. But not quite. Uh, yeah. Oh, actually, okay. The shortcut one actually was a little bit, a little bit less. All yeah, right. I think the oh, keyword okay. in this the keyword in this question is Apache Spark. So we want to use the Apache Spark to explore. So that tells you that it's not the SQL Analytics endpoint because the SQL Analytics endpoint SQLs in charge. Mm -hmm. So it's it's good stuff. And again, I think there's a lot here that you can get uh, from the product and <laughs> there's a lot of things that you can do with it after that one check in okay um just want to see if there's any other things that we need to do otherwise if there's no other cool questions that have come in we're going to move on to our summary again powerpoint needs to behave there we go all right hopefully we'll wrap this up your intrigued you're pumped you want to go ahead and get started with your exercises on the learn modules get to your certification so if you look at this video after it gets published we have described what end-to-end -end analytics in microsoft fabric is what it means uh by the way if you have any last minute questions now's the time to get them in the, into the chat so do it now we can get might wind up we talking about it here so you'll be famous for that we'll go from there we have described your core features capabilities of lake houses and microsoft fabric we actually created a, a lake house to show you just how easy it is to do this we threw in some data from csv and we created tables in the lake house again nothing it, it's just easy and then finally we were able to query the lake house tables with sql this is everything that's in that first module and you saw how easy it was to do everything how quickly and how it just made sense so try it out go do the exercises do the work because you want to get your certification in fact uh, one of the things they talked about at the conference was more people got their certification 
faster than any other certificate Microsoft has ever released. So this is huge. Fabric is a big deal. Now, again, here are the links. Go out, do the learn modules. Uh, we also have a second, I think the second version of this session. It's the same content, but we're doing um, we're doing it again for Europe, basically. So I think that's the link for them. And again, don't miss the next session, which is Apache Spark. So if you missed the notebook question, you want to be in here because we're gonna, they're going to go deep on how to work with Fabric using Apache Spark. And again, you want to continue your learning from there. And when, um, be, before we, um, yeah, before we leave the session, I just want to mention that if you're getting ready to take the exam, the DP 600, make sure that you go through all of the learn modules and especially right before the exam, make sure you review at least the learn modules is your bare minimum of what you need to know. And then for some of them, you need to branch out of the learn modules and learn a little bit more. So you need to know a little bit of DAX, you need to, um, know some of the areas a little bit more in depth, but at least bare minimum, you need to understand everything that's in the learn modules. That's your starting point. And there are a lot of great resources on DAX. Uh, there are books, there are videos, there are websites. There's a lot of interest and energy out there around DAX. So do, do the work. I know DAX is one of those things that some people either use it as the golden hammer for every need that's out there, which is drive so certain people in the, in our uh, community crazy. Um, and then there are others who they shy away with away from it because they're afraid of it. It's, it looks too hard. I, I say, take the middle ground, learn what you need to know, get the basics down, start to use it, use it appropriately, but you're going to need to have that background of knowledge for your certification. So, um, okay, so this is the schedule coming up. So again, Apache Spark is next, then Delta Lake, uh, Data Factory, uh, Data Flows, Gen 2, Data Warehouses, Fabric Lake House, using the Medallion Architecture Design, uh, ingesting with Spark and Fabric Notebooks. And then the, the one I like to highlight is actually the last one, the Administer Microsoft Fabric. You're coming from a administrator background and you're going through the series you definitely want to be in that one because they're going to speak directly to you as to how you administer all of this. Do you have any mm -hmm. favorites? Mm, I don't know. I I love the data factory ones. Those are my favorites because if you don't have any good data, you don't have any good reports. So no. I still, data is the center to everything, right? Um, there are two questions in the chat that I want to uh, go over. Yeah. Uh, quickly. Uh, one of them uh, says, how can I use the RLS role-level security with this new approach of semantic models? I'm assuming uh, this is referring to the uh, direct lake storage mode. And uh, the answer to that is that currently, as you saw, the experience is the web modeling. And the uh, RLS capability is there, but you cannot create it from the interface. You have to go to tabular editor uh, right now to enable role level security, but the ability is there. Um, now, if you define role level security at the um, back end, at the lake house level, uh, the model will detect that that's in place and it will fall back to direct query. That's the fallback um, option there. So hopefully that answered your question. And then, um, there is another question that just came in about the roadmap for Synapse versus Fabric. Uh, we need to start new analytics projects on Azure. Should we go straight for Fabric? Um, the answer is if you have access to Microsoft Fabric, the answer is yes. Um, at this point, any new project that you're starting, you should start with Microsoft Fabric. If you're if you have an existing project or implementation in, micro, in Synapse Analytics, it's not going to go away. It's going to stay there for a very, very, very long time. Microsoft is not going to take it away. Um, if you're starting from scratch, Fabric is the right choice for several reasons. Uh, one of them is that it's a software as a service version of the product. 
So it's going to be easier for you to maintain. Uh, the other reason is that this is the better version of the product. This is not just Azure Synapse Analytics packaged within Microsoft Fabric. It has been revamped, rewritten, entirely new capabilities are available here that it will be to your advantage to use. And then finally, you will even have potential of cost savings because here the cost is under a capacity that a lot of people are going to benefit from because a lot of people have their you know data loads data integration workloads lo uh, run during the non-business hours or after hours and then during the day you have your reporting workloads so if you put them together collectively in a capacity you're going to have cost savings on your side and then finally um the one thing for Azure Synapse Analytics or Azure Data Factory to remember is that while those products are supported and will stay, they will not receive any new features. So any new capability uh, coming out is going to go to Synapse in Microsoft Fabric or to Data Factory in Microsoft Fabric. So hopefully that gives you some ideas on how to make that call. And, and something Try else to have... consider too is um, there's a lot of energy right now around Copilot it's like you can't even turn around without hearing the word copilot. There's a lot of energy around AI in general. There is definitely already connectivity between OneLake and Azure AI uh, using the open AI models that they have. So this becomes your default place then to store a lot of data. Now, if you're expecting to just point open AI at structured data, don't do that yet. It's not ready for that. It, loses, there, there's some limitations to GPT models when it comes to structured data. It works very well though with unstructured data. As we start to see these worlds come together, uh, this may be the tipping point that pushes you to using Fabric because at some point you're gonna be scaling data to very large sizes. There's not a whole lot of other options to store large amounts of unstructured data uh, or semi-structured data that you will be ingesting into your GPTs. So if, you're, if your roadmap includes copilots, custom copilots, other types of AI, and you already are looking at Fabric for your data estate, that may be the tipping point that gets you there. So just Keep your head up as to what's coming because there is a lot of it. Uh, OpenAI and Microsoft are releasing new AI features almost as fast, if not faster, than the Fabric team. So it's kind of an interesting drag race, but hopefully that will give you the impetus to take a good hard look at Fabric. I think it's the best choice right now. It is. I, I really like it. It's a it's an enabler, um, especially if you're coming from a Power BI background, because that's my background, right? So you have you could create a Power BI reports and semantic models, but now you can also create a lake house or a warehouse right next to it, and many more things, and do all of your work in one place. Software as a service, no more provisioning, no more backend plumbing. Um, all those are backs; they're all gone. You don't need any of those. The if you're coming from Azure Data Factory, those. Uh, or Synapse Analytics, the Shires, the self-hosted integration runtimes, the, the Azure self-hosted integration runtime is gone. So overall, you have a lot of um, gains to get from uh, going to Fabric, even though it hasn't been out there that long. So what you see today is going to be different than what you're going to have a year from now. It's going to be significantly better a year from now than what it is today, even though today it's great. Um, it's fully usable for production workloads at the moment. All okay. Right. Well, with so, that, we we uh, we're getting the little finger from the, the from our director here saying, Mer, "Yes, we gotta <laughs> wrap it up here." So, last slide, because you know we don't want to bullet you to death here, but please take advantage of the Cloud Skills Challenge. Here's the link. You should be able to get to it. Get. Uh, I think the discount is active for this. I don't know. You have to look at the website to see what's available. They have been doing these discounts. We've seen anywhere from 50. We saw 30%. Uh, we've seen 100%. But even without the discount, I think it's totally worth it to get your certification in Fabric. There's a huge amount of interest around this from a, from a career perspective. I think it's a great investment in time and effort. And uh, I know I spent a week last week 
touring, talking to many companies, and Fabric came up in almost every conversation we had. Even those folks who still have on-premise SQL servers, yes, they still exist uh, in a lot of places. So hopefully this is a much better alternative for them. That's all I got. What do you got? Anything else to add or? That, that's it. That's it. So this was great. I just want to give a shout out to our wonderful producers behind the scenes. I don't know if people see them, but we have Matt Clemens and we have Taylor Parsons. So yes. thank you to both of you and as well as our fantastic moderators that shielded the questions for us. Thanks again. Thank you for the uh, great audience here and hopefully as Trep said, you will go and uh, try out Fabric and even get certified. So best of luck to you and have a great morning or night wherever you are in the world. Take care. Have a great one. Thanks. All right. Bye. See so we can do. Bye. <laughs> Bye.